Hello and welcome to Void Electronics. In today's video I would like to talk about the curve tracer. More specifically I want to demonstrate the basic usage of such a unit and also I would like to give you some insight about how it produces the IV curves that we see on the screen. But first of all let's talk about safety. There is a good reason why this fixture has a cover. And as you can see, once we select one of the two DOTs inside, we cannot open the cover. And that's because a curve tracer is a really dangerous piece of test equipment. Because in order to produce IV curves, it has to apply a test voltage. And that test voltage can go all the way up to 1 kV in the case of this device. So this is really, really, really dangerous. That's why you should only use this fixture or you should be very careful if you improvise something and use external wires. This is why it says danger high voltage right here. So please don't try this at home. So before doing any fancy stuff with it, let's take things step by step. The curve tracer plots current with respect to voltage. So this means that current is on the vertical axis and voltage is on the horizontal axis. Taking this into account, let's think about the most basic cases that we can actually test. Maybe pause the video and think about it for a while. Well. In my opinion, the most basic tests are the open circuit and the short circuit. So let's look at those first. Let's start with an open circuit. How would you expect an open circuit to look like on the curve tracer? Well, no matter how much you vary the voltage, you get zero current. That's what an open is, right? So this means that we will probably get a horizontal line. Let's see if our prediction is right. And it is. So what about the short circuit? Well, for the short circuit, the voltage is always zero and the current can vary as much as it wants. So that means it will look like a perfectly vertical line, right? Let's see. Yep, we were bang on with this prediction. So what about resistance? Well, Ohm's law basically states that the larger the voltage drop across the resistor, the larger the current, right? And current here is on the vertical axis and voltage is on the horizontal axis. So this means that we will get a line at a certain angle and that angle will vary based on the resistance. Let's see if that's right. Looks like we are right. So let's adjust the resistance and see how the angle changes. This is basically a short circuit. And this is the maximum resistance of this rheostat. So let's take things a step further and see if we can calculate the value of this rheostat. To do this, we have to look at the settings of the curve tracer. So first of all, the horizontal section is set at 0.1 volts per division. So every single division that we see here is 0.1 volts. And then the vertical sensitivity is set to 1 milliamp per division. So just to remind you, resistance is voltage divided by current. But on the curve tracer, a better way to look at it is the change in voltage divided by the change in current. Here we can take advantage of the subdivisions that we have here and look at the current change for a voltage change of four divisions. So the tray starts right here, it changes four divisions up to this middle line, which means 0.4 volts. And the current changes by 1.1 divisions, which means 1.1 milliamps. And now we can just do the math. So it is 0.4 divided by 1.1, which gives us a value of 363 ohms. Not bad, taking into account the fact that this one says 330 ohms. Of course, the examples that I showed you so far are for teaching purposes only. We all know that nobody bothers to use a curve tracer for measuring resistance. That's what ohmmeters are for. So this implies that there are some specific cases where the curve tracer makes sense. Well, an ohmmeter applies a test current and measures the voltage across the device under test, which is perfectly okay for resistors, but in other cases it doesn't tell the complete story. So one such case can be observed when testing diodes. Let's connect this 1N4148 to the multimeter. Okay, so this is the resistance of the diode. It's around 1.35 kilo ohms, right? I don't know, let's change the range, for example. Okay, now it's 10.9K. 
now it's 84k now it's 639k now it's 1.1 meg 1.1 meg once again and now it's an overload so what happens here it looks like the multimeter doesn't agree to itself basically so to demystify this experiment we have to connect an emitter in series with a diode and here we can see the test current for various resistance ranges so for the 500 ohm range the test current is around 1 milliamp and the meter shows an overload for the 5k range the test current is around 410 microamps and the value is 1.4 kilo ohms for the 50k range the test current is around 40 microamps and we read a resistance of around 11.3 kilo ohms for the 500 kilo ohm range the test current is around 4 microamps and so on which means that the meter tests the diode at various test currents and since the diode is non-linear we get a different value every single time of course in such cases there is always the option of doing point-to-point -point measurements and plotting them using excel or something similar however it is far more convenient to use the curve tracer and this is how we get the characteristic curve of a diode this is of course the forward region of a diode and by looking at this we can already tell a few things about the diode First of all, we can have a look at the voltage where it starts conducting. So, at around 100 millivolts, nothing happens. 200 is pretty much the same, 300, 400. So, at around 500 millivolts, it starts conducting, which is typical for silicon diodes. And then, at significant current, we get a characteristic voltage of around 650 millivolts. And this curve is, of course, described by Shockley's diode equation. So what else can we look at? Well, we can also look at matching, if that's important to us. I have two identical diodes here, so we can quickly switch from one to another and see if they match or not. They are close enough. And also, by flipping the polarity and increasing the voltage, we can have a look at the reverse characteristic as well. So you may already know that the diode can only take so much voltage before it goes into breakdown. And the curve tracer is perfect for observing this. Here it is. So we are at 20 volts per division and as you can see at slightly above 100 volts this diode goes into breakdown. And let me show you another interesting thing about the same two diodes that I showed you before. Weirdly enough I managed to damage the other diode by stressing it with a curve tracer at a relatively high power in breakdown. And here's what the permanent damage to that diode looks like. So as you can see, a diode that tests perfectly fine in the forward region acts totally wrong in the reverse region due to, that, due to that stress. So it starts conducting at around 10 volts, maybe less. So yeah, actually at about 5 volts it starts conducting in reverse. Which is not supposed to happen for a 1N4148. Which once again demonstrates that weird faults like this one can really only be discovered efficiently using a curve tracer. So what about transistors? Well for transistors things are a little bit more complicated because they are three terminal devices. And in the case of bipolar transistors you have to drive the base as you characterize it because it behaves differently at different base currents of course. So what you usually do for a bipolar transistor is that you look at the collector current with respect to a collector to emitter voltage and you drive the transistors at different base currents in order to have a look at the characteristic. So here's what happens as you increase the base current. As you can see, the larger the base current, the larger the collector current. And we also see the characteristic behavior of a transistor. So here it more or less behaves like a current source. An ideal current source would be perfectly horizontal, of course. In this case, we see that it has a slight angle to it, which means that the transistor is not ideal. So it's like a current source that has a certain finite output impedance. Now, if you look at any transistor datasheet, of course, this is not what the curves look like. So what they do in the datasheet is that they drive the transistor at different base currents and then they overlap the characteristics. 
and the curve tracer can of course do this and this is where this corner comes in this is the step generator so it can do more than just driving the base at a fixed current so the step generator can generate steps that are either voltage steps or current steps depending on your type of transistor that you're characterizing so for field effect transistors you would want voltage steps and for bipolar transistors you would like to have current steps so here we have a bc 546 transistor and i use pretty much the same settings that they used in the old fairchild datasheet so we will generate steps of 50 microamps so once again this is what the transistor behaves at zero base current it's basically in cutoff this is how it behaves for 50 microamps let's turn off the lights maybe this will make the graph better this is how it behaves at 100 microamps, 150, 200, 250, 300, and so on. And if we compare this to what we see in the datasheet, the graph is close enough. A nice thing about this is that you can once again match transistors if you want to. That's because this fixture has two sockets in it, and you can quickly switch from one socket to another. So this is what the left transistor looks like. And this is what the right transistor looks like. So as you can see, it doesn't have exactly the same characteristics. And it also changes as it heats up. That's because everything varies with temperature when we are talking about semiconductors. And also we can have a look at beta and how it varies with respect to base current or collector current. For example, the first line that we see here is at 50 microamps of base current and if you look at the collector current we have around 14 milliamps or so and by dividing the collector current by the base current we get a beta of around 280 looking at the next curve we have about 25 milliamps of collector current and 100 microamps of base current which gives us a beta of 250 so as you can see beta decreases as we increase the base current and by the way the data sheet specifies a beta range between 200 and 450 so this transistor is within spec now what they don't show in the data sheet is that the transistor also has a breakdown region so if you keep increasing the collector voltage at one point the currents all of a sudden start going up and this is where the breakdown starts happening And by the way, the curve tracer can damage semiconductors and electronic components in general. And this is why it has a power limiter. So you can set the maximum power to 2 watts, 0 0.5, 0 0.1 and so on. And as you can see, it limits the power. And this is the effect the power limiter has on the curves. And also in order to protect devices, the curve tracer has a series resistance with a collector supply, which can be set using this knob. Right now it's at 250 ohms. And now that we've characterized the transistor, let's have a look at the waveforms produced by the curve tracer in order to understand how it works. Let's start with the collector supply. So as we increase the voltage, we notice a rectified sine wave on the oscilloscope. And this is what the curve tracer uses in order to characterize various components. Of course we can switch it to DC and then we get a DC voltage. However, most of the time we use it in AC mode. On the second channel, we can also have a look at the step generator. Right now it's producing no steps at all. And here it is producing one step, two steps, three steps, and so on. So by combining various base currents with various collector voltages, we get a characteristic curves of a bipolar transistor. And in case you were wondering, yes, it can characterize vacuum tubes too. Assuming that you have an external power supply for the heater, of course. Wait for it. And look at that. Isn't it beautiful? I think it's very beautiful. So here are the typical triode curves. 
And finally, here's one of the most exotic semiconductors to look on the curve tracer, which is of course the tunnel diode. With the tunnel diode, as we increase the current through it, it reaches a point where it goes into a really strange region, which is this one. This one is a region where the diode has negative differential resistance, which is a really interesting property to have. So this can be used in oscillators, amplifiers, and it was typically used in the trigger circuits of oscilloscopes from the 1970s and 1980s. So if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you're interested in more content related to electronics and programming, please follow or subscribe to this channel because there is more content like this on the way. That's it for now. Bye.